folks, this physics podcast is on heat transfer and specific heat. So in particular, what we'll be talking about is as follows. First, we'll define heat and compare it to internal energy, which we learned about last time. We'll briefly talk about the second law of thermodynamics and what that tells us about how heat moves. We will explore the three methods uh, by which heat can be transferred from one object to another. We will take a look at something called specific heat capacity and kind of dissect what that really means about how an object behaves and responds to heat energy. And then the last thing that we'll do is solve a few problems involving specific heat capacity. And that's going to allow us to figure out how objects that are in thermal contact are going to behave, what final equilibrium temperature they'll reach, and so first of all, a basic definition of heat, it gets thrown around a lot in our everyday language, but there's a kind of different scientific definition for heat. Um, it's represented by a capital or lowercase q in an equation, and heat is really defined as energy that's transferred between objects due to a difference in their temperatures. Um, so heat is a specific type of energy, and like all other forms of energy, it's measured in joules. But what's really key about the definition of heat in the scientific community is that heat must be in the process of transferring between two objects. What we think of heat being captured in an object is actually called internal energy. So when that energy is just contained in a single object, we call it internal energy. But as soon as that internal energy gets passed off to a new object, then we call that energy heat. I know it's kind of a nuanced difference, but just kind of let it sink in a little bit, and I'm happy to answer questions in class as well. Okay. Now, in terms of figuring out which way heat is going to move, here's a fancy explanation for something you already know. The second law of thermodynamics states that energy tends to spread out. You might also have heard of this as entropy, which is a measure of how spread out energy is, increasing. Okay, that's just the fancy term, but basically all the second law says is that energy tends to spread out. It doesn't clump up in one place, okay, which is why if we have two objects, one has a lot of internal energy, it's very hot, and another object is very cold, we're going to find that that heat energy is going to move from the hot object to the cold object because our energy tends to want to spread out. Okay. Now that's something you already know. You know that an ice cube is not going to heat up a cup of hot soup. It's going to be the other way around. So this is just common sense. But if you want to impress your friends, you can throw out second law of thermodynamics to explain the very obvious. Okay. So now that we've talked a little bit about what heat is and which way it tends to go, let's talk about the three ways that heat can be transferred from one object to another. The first method is called conduction, and this is the most common sense, obvious sort of heat transfer method. Conduction occurs when we've got two objects that are in physical direct contact with each other, passing heat from one to the other. Okay, so one example would be if I were stupid for some reason and put my hand on a hot stove, my hand is in direct physical contact with that stove, that stove is going to pass off heat energy into my hand, thereby burning me. Another example would be if I then held an ice cube. The heat from my hand would directly transfer into the ice cube because they're in direct contact with one another. Okay? So that's conduction. Another method of heat transfer that's less commonly thought of is called convection. And the key to convection is the movement of fluid. So the idea behind this is that we've got some sort of hot fluid, a hot liquid or a hot gas, that's moving around. And in the process of moving around an object, it's sort of transferring heat energy into it. So for example, if you like to bake, I know I like to bake, um, what you'll notice is that you always have to preheat your oven. And the reason for that is you have to give the air in your oven some time to get hot so that then when you put your brownies or your cookies or whatever deliciousness you're putting in, you've got lots of hot air in the oven circulating around your food and that allows it to cook faster. Another example would be minute rice or the rice in a bag. You stick it in a pot of boiling water and that hot water circulates around the bag, 
very efficiently transferring heat energy into it. So that's convection. Our last method of heat transfer is radiation. Now radiation is a little different because there is no direct physical contact whatsoever in radiation. All of that heat energy is transferred via electromagnetic or just light waves. So for example, if you're outside on a nice warm sunny day, you feel the sun rays hitting your skin, it warms you up, that's an example of radiation. Or if you go to a restaurant and you sit outside and it's really cold, they might put out heat lamps. You don't have to physically touch the heat lamp to get warm. It radiates out these invisible electromagnetic waves that heat you up. So there are three methods of transfer. Now let's go in a slightly different direction and get a little bit more mathematical with it. Right? Now I'm sure that you've had the experience of going out somewhere, uh, driving to a friend's house or to run some errands on a hot summer day. You leave your car out in the sun and you come back to it several hours later. Okay, obviously not a pleasant experience. Now some of you may even have made the mistake of um, leaving a bottle of water in your car, getting back to it, and being utterly parched. So you walk into your car, you grab the water bottle, you take a drink of it, quite unpleasant. You might also grab your seat belt, I hope you're putting on your seat belt, and sometimes you accidentally hit the metal part of it also very unpleasant. Okay, now the point of this whole complex scenario is this. We've got a water bottle that's been sitting out in the hot car. We've got a metal seat belt that's been sitting out in the hot car. However, I know for me, my reaction to these two things is very different. The water is warm and gross and unpleasant, but the metal seat belt actually burns me, which seems weird because they've both been in the same hot car why would they respond so differently? Why would they feel so different? Okay. Another example of what we're about to talk about is um, when you eat a slice of pizza that's like fresh out of the oven or really, really good. I know for me, I've never been burned by pizza crust before, but I have definitely gotten seriously burned by sauce and cheese on a pizza. Again, all of those ingredients were in the same hot oven. How come some of them feel so different from others? Now the reason behind this is a particular property of different substances called specific heat capacity. We represent that with a lowercase c. And the um, technical definition of specific heat capacity is the amount of energy needed to change the temperature of some mass of a substance by one degree Celsius. Now that's very fancy. Basically what that tells us is if we have an object with a low specific heat, it's very responsive to heat energy. It doesn't take a lot of energy to get the temperature of that object to change. An example would be um, your metal seat belt, which um, you know was sitting in the car, its temperature went way up as a result of the heat energy circulating around in that car. The um, water, on the other hand, has a very high specific heat, so it tends to store that heat energy rather than using it to increase its temperature. Now we can use specific heat to predict how much an object's temperature will change given a certain amount of heat energy transferred into it using the formula Q equals MC delta T. In this equation, Q represents the heat energy that's being transferred into an, or out of an object. M represents the mass of the subject measured in kilograms as always. C is the specific heat capacity. The units for that are joules per kilogram degree Celsius. I know those are kind of icky. And then lastly, delta T represents the change in temperature. And to calculate the change in temperature, we've got that second equation there. It's just the final temperature minus the initial temperature. And we're going to measure all of that in degrees Celsius. So some sample problems for you. We've got one here. We're trying to raise the temperature of 1.8 kilograms of water. So the first thing I'm going to do, same as always, write down all the things that I know. And here's a big old list of things that I know. I know the mass is 1.8 kilograms. I know the specific heat of water. It's given to me in the problem. I know the initial and final temperatures of the water. So if I want to figure out how much the temperature changed, I just take the final temperature, which is 80 degrees, minus the initial temperature, which is 10 degrees, to get a total change of 70 degrees Celsius. I'm trying to solve for the heat energy, so that means Q is my unknown. 
The equation I have that relates these things is Q equals MC delta T. So at this point, I can just plug and chug. So I multiply the mass times the specific heat times that change in temperature. And I determine that it's going to take 526,680 joules of energy to raise the temperature of my 1.8 kilograms of water by 70 degrees. Now another problem. This one's a little bit more challenging, but stay with me. Okay. We've got a 0.12 kilogram sample of iron. It's really hot, 98.9 degrees Celsius. We stick it into a container of water that's 25 degrees Celsius. They both then come to a final equilibrium temperature of 30.1 degrees. We want to figure out the mass of water that was inside that container. Now we can do this based just on the information that we've got. Now since I've got two objects in thermal contact, I like to organize the information that I know into two columns. One for my first object, which in this case is the iron, and one for my second object, which in this case is the water. So I've filled out all the things that I know. Feel free to pause this for a moment if you need a second to just write down everything that we've got in there. But basically, here are the things that I don't know. I don't know the mass of the water, obviously. I also don't know the heat energy for either the iron or the water. Okay. So on my water side, I have two unknowns I can't solve for the water yet. But on my iron side, I only have one unknown. So I'm going to go ahead and solve for the heat energy lost by the iron, first of all. Okay, so I can solve for the heat energy lost by the iron using Q equals MC delta T using just the values in my iron column, not the values in my water column. So if I plug in all those values and multiply it through, I can determine that the iron must have lost 3,715.2 joules of energy. Now you see the negative there? The negative just means that that energy was lost rather than gained. We know that the iron lost heat energy because it was the hotter object. Now here's how this is helpful in solving for the mass of the water. When the iron lost that heat, it was giving that heat to the water. Those were the two objects in thermal contact with each other. So what I know then is that whatever amount of energy the water gained has to be the same as the energy the iron lost. So if the iron lost 3,715.2 joules of energy, I know that's the amount of energy my water gained. So I can go back to my table of things that I know and fill all of that in. So now I know the amount of heat that the iron lost, and then similarly, I know that the water gained that same amount. Okay, so it's the same number. I've made it positive because in this case the water is gaining that heat. Now in my water column, I only have one unknown, so I can solve for the mass. Again, using that same equation, Q equals MC delta T, this time using all my values on the water side. So I'll plug in everything that I know. I'm solving for the mass. So to solve for the mass, get it by itself on one side, I'll divide both sides by 4,180 and 6.1. And then I just plug it into my calculator, and I determined that we must have had 0.146 kilograms of water. Wa-bam, we did it. That is it for this podcast. Please feel free to go back and revisit things that were unclear the first time, and bring your questions in to me in class. Have a wonderful day.